resource of information to TV writers. I'm going to get into our model in a minute, but what I want to be really clear about is that we don't tell writers what to write. And for those of you who've been around Hollywood, they would never work with us if we tried to tell them what to write because um, Hollywood script writers are masterful storytelling tellers. They're masterful storytellers. So we wouldn't tell them how to tell a story. What we do is serve as a support to them to provide accurate information so that when they're talking about health, they'll talk about it accurately. We've been funded for eight years now by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We also have funding from the California Endowment, and that's a private health foundation in California. They support us in, you know, for the most part when people talk about health, they think about smart choices. People equate health with individual risk and behavior. If I minimize my risk and I make smart choices about what I eat, my exercise, and what I do, I'll be healthy. But actually, there's another very important factor, and that's the environment, or the way that space and place impact our health. So we could tell women, tell mothers, for example, get your kids out to the park every day to exercise, and make sure to feed them healthy foods. But if they live in neighborhoods where there's, there's no fresh produce, there are only liquor stores, and they're in a neighborhood where it's unsafe to send a child out to play, you're not going to get a healthy child. So we have to deal with the social determinants. And then think about the challenges of getting writers to portray space and place or the environment in TV storylines. That's a challenge. Okay, we also have funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And they support us in focusing on global health topics. So we're working with U.S. script writers. And we're finding ways to inspire them to address global health. Many times these are, these are writers who have never traveled to Africa or to Asia. So they've never been immersed in other cultures. And so we're working to create an environment that inspires and informs them so that they'll include global health topics in the TV storylines. We also have funding from two other government agencies under HRSA, and that's the Division of Organ Transplantation. You can imagine there's a lot of good drama that comes out of organ transplant. Um, and also the poison control program. Also good for dramatic storylines. So what I want to go to now is a clip from, um, I think that's what it's going to be, a clip from The Bold and the Beautiful. This is a daytime soap opera. As Arvind said, these soaps have very wide reach. They're aired in 200 countries around the world. Um, Hollywood Health and Society took uh, two experts from the CDC to talk with the writers of The Bold and the Beautiful about HIV and AIDS. So listen for the key messages on uh, reducing stigma around HIV and AIDS and on heterosexual transmission of the virus. There's a long lead in, so I have to keep talking. Uh, what else can I tell you? Um, daytime soaps. Here we go. I have AIDS. No, you are HIV positive. Turn it down. Is it too loud? AIDS is the late stage condition of the virus. It takes time for the HIV to reach that stage. We'll get you proper treatment. Treatment? Being HIV positive is no longer a death sentence, Tony. With a daily regimen of proteins, inhibitors, and other antiviral medications, you can live with this disease. Live with it? And what kind of life am I going to have? HIV can live very, very normal lives. Normal life. I'm not normal! I'm sick! I got the most terrifying, horrible news I've ever heard of in my life. From who? From a doctor. 
Ellen's doctor? My doctor. I'm sick, Kristen. What do you mean you're sick? Doctor gave me a blood test and uh, it came back positive. For what? And tell me, what was the test for? I'm HIV. I'm HIV positive. And that's what we wanted to talk to you about. What we can do. Well, as you know, this isn't an exact science. So what I'm going to tell you are my views. And personally, I'd rather err on the side of caution. One of the ways HIV is transmitted is through blood. Tony's blood is infected. If it comes into contact with your blood, Kristen, you could become HIV positive yourself. Blood, what about other bodily fluids? Your semen carries the same risk. Your saliva does not. So we can kiss? Well, yes, of course. But please keep in mind, if you have any open sores in your mouth, cold sores, bleeding gums, and absolutely not, even something as innocent as kissing can bring you into contact with each other's blood. And that's what you have to avoid at all costs. Kristen. I love you. Yes. I want you to be my wife. <laughs> all of these kids were orphaned by age. And millions more. But they might not be willing to tell you that. Sandy told us his parents were in a car crash. You have to understand the fear. These children have dealt with so much rejection in their short lives. So what really happened to him? He watched his mother die. He had been taking care of her and his little brother himself, going from door to door, begging for food. His little brother? He had AIDS too? Yes. We got back to Los Angeles and we missed you. We missed you so much. And we figured since you're living here without any parents, and we're living there without any children, it made us sad. So we decided that, um, that you could come live with us and be our son. So um, Hollywood Health and Society developed a public service announcement, a PSA. It was aired the first time on August 3rd, if you look at the two red arrows. Um, it featured Tony, the lead character, referring people to a <coughs> CDC AIDS hotline call-in number. So it was aired first on August 3rd, which was the day Tony learned he was HIV positive. <coughs> and the second time it aired was on August 13th, another dramatic plot point, the day Tony told his fiance he was HIV positive. So if you look at this, um, it resulted in the highest peak in callers all year on August 13th, 5,313 calls in a single day. Now what we did is tracked all of the calls to the hotline over 12 months. So anytime this hotline was mentioned in the media, we plotted it on this graph. So there was a 60 minutes episode about um, HIV AIDS referring people to call. There was a Surgeon General PSA that aired. There was an MTV special, very hip and cool, appealing to young people. And then there was a great big national HIV AIDS get testing campaign that was very highly financed. And it was the second highest peak, but it didn't reach the level of August 13th, Bold and the Beautiful. So I have a question for you. If you look at August 3rd and August 13th, they're both dramatic plot points in the storyline. Tony learns he's HIV positive on the third. 
He tells his fiancée on the 13th. Why were there so many more callers on the 13th? Because people could relate with the experience and they were urged within just to call. <laughs> okay, that's it a good... Gave them more confidence. Gave them more confidence? Those people probably were in relationships themselves. Like, like if I were in a relationship with someone and someone was on the episode revealing to their partner that they had HIV, I would want to know because I have a partner too. Exactly. Okay, so... My question is, who was watching the soap? Daytime soaps. Everybody. Well, women. women. So women are watching this show. The calls came on August 13th, the day, as you said, there was a relationship and the man tells the woman he's HIV positive. So there we go. So what that tells us, it demonstrates that TV viewers can be moved to seek more information about health topics when a PSA is tied to a dramatic plot point in a storyline, and also when there are characters they relate to. So that's a really important piece of this. <coughs> so <coughs> how do we do this? You know, Hollywood Health and Society has a model. You know, as you can imagine, every single issue advocacy group in the world wants to work with Hollywood writers because everybody wants to get their issue onto a TV show because it has such wide reach and huge impact. Our model is the flip side. Our model is actually the opposite of a traditional public health campaign. So for those of you who are involved in communications, in a traditional outreach campaign, you're designing a campaign around key messages. You produce or co-produce a campaign and you have control from beginning to end. And you know what your end products are gonna look like. In our model, we have no control over the end product. We aren't producing or co-producing anything. We don't tell the writers what to write. So what do we do? <coughs> we conduct outreach. So we do expert briefings and, and consultations with writers. We actually take health experts to the writers' rooms. We go right into the writers' rooms. There might be 20 network executives and writers around a table, or there might be three. But we take an expert, we spend one hour, and this expert talks about a health topic. We prepare them to tell case studies, real stories of real people, because that's what writers are looking for. They want to know what's really happening in the world. And then they take off from there and they spin their story from a real case study. We also provide um, tip sheets. And what I always ask uh, our experts before we go into the writer's room, if you could reach, and you could all ask yourselves this, because I'm sure you're all experts in some area or you're passionate about a, a certain area. If you could reach 20 million people in one hour with three messages about what you care about, what would they be? What would those messages be? And that's what we challenge our experts with. Come up with three to five key messages. And once we have that from the writers and we help them phrase them, we capture them and put them in a tip sheet and we also add a lot of other data about that topic, facts. And this tip sheet goes into a folder. So we have these blue folders with a whole lot of background information on our program, but also on the topic at hand, the bio of the expert, the tip sheets, and some articles usually that the expert has authored or has recommended. Every single writer in that room walks out with this packet. So it's almost like the memory of the briefing in their hand. We also have a lot of resources online so this is kind of how we work. Some of the shows brainstorm with us. They're very transparent about their creative process. They involve us in that. Other shows, total opposite. They won't even crack a smile. We'll sit there for an hour, total deadpan. They don't want us to know whether they like it or they don't. They do ask a lot of questions and they have people recording everything that's said, but they don't want to give away what might show up on next week's episode of ER or Grey's Anatomy. So it's, it's different. We also respond to inquiries. Uh, when writers are writing about a topic, and we don't work just with the, the health shows. We work with all the crime shows, we work with children's programming, we work with Spanish language telenovela. You name it, if 